You know what movie I think of first when I think about gay movies from the 1990s? The films from that time that really showcase the queer experience? That's right, Fight Club, the extremely dark and violent movie about a bunch of guys beating each other up for fun. Now, I know what you're gonna say. Owen, the movie about a bunch of men having secret meetups where they take off their shirts and wrestle with each other is the most heterosexual movie ever made. <laughs> and if anyone is still doubting this film's LGBT plus credentials, I again hasten to remind you that the man who wrote the book, Chuck Balahinnick, <laughs> is a gay man who wasn't publicly out yet at the time of its publication. Also, the guy who wrote American Psycho is queer too, and the Wachowskis are trans, so that's three out of three in cell favorite properties that are rolling with the LGBT, cope, seethe, etc. I am obviously far from the first person to point out that Fight Club is kind of gay, actually, in case you thought that video essayists on YouTube came up with anything themselves. I paid an AI to write this entire video. It did tell me to piss off and then nuked Canada, but it also refunded my 10 quid, so who's to say what's good and bad, really? So I don't want to just sit here today and recount all the ways in which Fight Club is kind of gay if you squinted it a little bit. No, my friends, my pitch to you today is that Fight Club should be considered genuine queer cinema right next to Carol and Moonlight and whatever the hell Roland Emmerich thought he was doing with that Stonewall movie. For this is not just a film that can be interpreted as gay. This is a fully fledged gay film and I will no longer stand for its exclusion. This counts as activism. Let's go. Okay, Owen, oh, the whole bit where, like, you hold on the shot for too long before cutting away for a cheap joke is actually getting really old, and if you keep dragging it out, you'll never be taken seriously. So, a very quick rundown of the plot for the uninitiated. An unnamed man referred to as the narrator in the book and played by Edward Norton in the movie, feeling dissatisfied with his cold office job life, meets rebellious outsider Tyler Durden, played by Angelina Jolie's widow ex, and they soon form a secret club together with other disaffected men where they fight each other for fun, almost like some kind of brawl society. Yeah! This society mutates into a violent cult that plots to commit acts of terror across the unnamed city that they live in. When our main man objects to Tyler taking the group in this direction, he soon discovers that, spoiler alert for the 23 year old movie, he is Tyler Durden. Tyler Durden is him, it's one guy with a split personality. The narrator tries to stop Tyler's plan and either succeeds or fails at this depending on your interpretation and, likely your politics, they are specifically blowing up credit card companies, and he also maybe or maybe doesn't banish the Tyler persona from himself forever by shooting himself through the cheek. Actually, upon reflection, this is an extremely straight movie. Just a couple of guys being dudes. Or I guess one guy being a couple of dudes. Fellas, is it gay to watch yourself have a bath? Okay, so let's start at the beginning. When we first meet the narrator, he's feeling an intense dissatisfaction with his cold corporate life to the point where he's suffering from unending insomnia. Boring cubicle office job, bland apartment with everything chosen from a catalogue, everything he does in his life is done serving a very surface level attempt to fit in with polite society. Personally, I think this man complaining about having a job that pays well enough to own his own apartment and all the stuff in it in his late 20s hits a little differently now than it did in 1999, but hey ho, you know how it goes, my generation is completely fucked. For a bit of wider context here, it's important to remember that it was a pretty big trend in American films of the late 90s to depict, in a variety of ways, a growing dissatisfaction with modern life, prompted by the idea pushed by like Francis Fukuyama, that we had reached the end of history. All the great wars have been fought, all major catastrophes experienced, and now it was supposedly time for us to sit back and enjoy the fruits of our ancestors' labours, but with a certain lack of great purpose or destiny always gnawing away at you. Tyler Durden actually has a monologue about this in the movie. We're the middle children of history, man. No purpose or place. We have no great war. No great depression. Our great war is a spiritual war. Our great depression is our lives. So of course, while I do still strongly believe that Fight Club is an exploration of a gay man rebelling against the need to conform to a very heterosexual society, it's also exploring this sense of dissatisfaction with the status quo in general. It's an anti-capitalist story just as much as it is a gay one. The two often go together, funnily enough. I can count all the right-wing gay people I know on no hands. The narrator tries to conform to the very straight, very capitalist society by submitting to consumerism. He buys things, he makes his apartment look just like the ones in the magazines. But he still can't sleep. He can never drop his guard in case someone sees through the performance, which technically makes him an actor. That's another point in the gay column as far as I'm concerned. To try and assuage his insomnia, he ends up attending a variety of support groups, mostly ones for various kinds of serious illnesses. He is able to cry here, expressing an emotional vulnerability that would, especially in the 90s, be seen as effeminate and shameful for a man to do openly. The group visits in general have the vibe of a gay man cruising, going to these places after work and under cover of darkness to physically embrace and be vulnerable with other men. Hang on, you're telling me that I could have just gone to a cancer support group this whole time and gotten a boyfriend? 
Well, let me just go ahead and ring up the trusty old NHS about this one. <laughs> Right, well, they called me a slur and hung up, so once he starts going to these meetings, exposing himself emotionally to male strangers, he can finally sleep. He's no longer constantly stressed about people finding out who he really is. He has an outlet for that now. All oh, that is, until someone new enters the group to ruin the whole thing for him. A woman! The second that she arrives, he finds himself once more unable to cry in the sessions and therefore unable to sleep. You know what, scratch the title of this video, the narrator's clearly just a gamer. I bet he's up all night playing Street Fighter. <laughs> really? What? Who writes this, man? Ah, yeah, that makes sense. So this woman named Marla Singer starts attending all the support groups that the narrator attends for the same underhanded reasons that he is, because it's the only place in our false world where anyone is real to each other. She appears to be set up as our main love interest for the narrator, being the female lead and all, but he clearly doesn't show any interest in her at all. I guess he must just be playing hard to get or something. In fact, he's outright hostile to her. Pretty much every conversation they have is him berating her. The one time where he does something that could be construed as flirting, asking for her number so they can coordinate days to go to different support groups and therefore avoid each other, it all again feels like a performance. Like he's doing this because it's something that he believes men do to women. That's the expectation, the ideal for heterosexual interaction. And speaking of heterosexual ideals, and we need to make a change, not gay. Tyler Durden is the manifestation of everything the narrator wishes he could be, i.e. the straightest man alive. Well, the straightest man alive who also happens to dress like this. I guess the narrator couldn't help going a little wild with his deviant art OC. He's cool, he's confident, he's rebelling against the man. Again, we have this very weird dichotomy of the narrator wanting to be what he already is. Plus, to bring it back to the gay, as I always make sure to do on this channel, the narrator is clearly immediately more attracted to Tyler than he is to Marla. When his condo blows up, we'll get to that, he decides not to ask Marla for help and instead asks the hunky and mysterious man that he made up in his mind. So the narrator thinks that he's pathetic, but he's also attracted to himself, but he can't ask himself for help because he's too attracted to himself, but while also viewing himself as pathetic, he is attracted to his... Fight Club is a 1999 film directed by David Finch. We also can't ignore that the condo blowing up in the first place can be seen as a pretty direct metaphor for a sudden and unwanted outing of a person's sexuality. The narrator talks about how embarrassing it is that all of his private things are now out in public for strangers to gawp at. How embarrassing. Right after this, he then reaches out to the LGBT community for help and to find a new place to live his life, which is a common experience for many queer people just starting out in their self-discovery journeys. It's also revealed later that Tyler deliberately blew up the narrator's apartment by leaving the gas on, maybe turning this into more of a story of a gay man who bottled up all his feelings for too long and they quite literally exploded. <laughs> When the narrator and Tyler are living together, they live in what looks like a nice family home that has been rotting for a while. The whole place is a testament to them both, or again, just one person, rejecting the heterosexual domestic norm for something that outside society often considers a weird and unnatural inversion of that. One of the things they talk about while Tyler is naked in the bath God, they were roommates. Is their absent fathers, or father, or maybe the narrator has two dads and they're each talking about one in sync, like some kind of gay trauma figure skating team. Figure... gating. <laughs> Regardless, this is a pretty common theme in works about gay men, a neglectful or outright absent father that becomes a focal point for our character's traumas. Being openly more in touch with your feminine side is something that all men, not just queer men, have been ridiculed for for ages, whether it's wearing pink, flower arranging, enjoying one of three separate TV shows in the 2010s. These are all things that men have often been afraid to do in public, lest they get called gay, or worse, a woman. Okay, that last thing was obviously a joke. If you're a Doctor Who, Supernatural, or Sherlock fan, you are definitely gay. Um, you can take that pride flag down, mate. That TARDIS keychain is enough of a rainbow bat signal for everyone already. Is your family accepting of your LGBTQ lifestyle? Staying with the feminine for the moment, we need to bring things back to Marla Singer, who Tyler starts having s with while the narrator is living with him. Again, this is actually the narrator doing it with Marla, but he's only able to perform the act from a place of extreme detachment, literally picturing himself overhearing all this from different rooms of the house. The s that they have is extremely loud and violent, like they're putting on a performance for someone else. I would play it for you to prove my point, but YouTube will literally hit me with a bus. It's like this because, again, it's the narrator's invented idea of how a cool, buff, straight dude like Tyler would have s with a woman, something that the narrator wouldn't know how to do or have any interest in learning how to do. 
he is still extremely cold to Marla, which obviously confuses her quite a bit because she's just a silly woman who doesn't understand that real chads can switch between nerd and cool mode whenever they like. <laughs> um, uh, to all my fellow chads out there, I would love some tips because I've been stuck on nerd mode for like 25 years. Yeah, 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 and I know what you've been wondering this whole time. Is Marla Singer? Does she perhaps? Would she maybe? Well, she doesn't really talk about herself enough for us to find out because this movie is for the boys. Yeah, this is a movie about men and the male gaze and the male gaze. You want a women-led movie that's like this too? Freaking bad. Uh, addendum to this, when I typed in Fight Club for Women on Google, this movie came up. Did you know that Alec Baldwin has more psych awards than any other male actor? Anyway, where was I? Oh yeah, does Marla Singer is gay. Uh, she smokes and she wears leather jackets. Good enough. Welcome to the club. Send her the bouquet in the L word box set. So if we take every queer metaphor we've learned so far and we apply it to the scrapping society in this movie, you know, the movie about the scrapping society, that society becomes a pretty clear metaphor for doing the horizontal tango. You know, the old no shirt shuffle. She fights on my club until I get demonetized. A lot of men dissatisfied with the ways that society has forced them to conform, meeting up with other men in dark and secluded spaces to grapple and wrestle with each other. It's an extension of what the narrator was doing with those support groups. The main objective of the whole thing is to be emotionally and physically free with another man. Fighting has also been used as a metaphor for boinking since Shakespeare was making willy jokes about swords while getting his back blown out by half of London, but that's another video. The rules of Fight Club, don't talk about it specifically, would be common knowledge for someone used to hiding their sexuality when not in a safe space. The narrator talks about people being different in the daytime than they are at night when in Fight Club. We see the members recognising each other outside of the club and passing each other knowing glances before going about their day like they're just another normal member of society. Fold this in with how his non-Fight Club co-workers react when they find out that the narrator has been secretly fighting and the evidence is overwhelming, your honour. So all of that is more than enough to convict this movie of the crime of being just like me for real. I could end the video here, but I'm irritating and I've also been grounded again by the radical left for trying to make the geese in the park kiss. Because there's another aspect of Fight Club that I haven't actually touched on much yet, which I think not only cements its status as iconic queer cinema, but also links two of its themes together in still one of the most interesting ways I've ever seen in a film. I am talking, of course, about... So I obviously can't speak for Chuck because he doesn't speak about his personal life that often, but he is a gay man who was born in 1962, which means he was alive for the Stonewall riots and wrote Fight Club when deaths from HIV AIDS were at their peak in the United States. Since childhood, he would have become used to seeing, as many queer people did, a constant connection between being gay and extreme violence, even death. And I think that Fight Club is quite clearly a work that is heavily influenced by that lived experience. The narrator is roughly the same age as Chuck when he wrote the novel, which means that he would have grown up with this association too. With a gnawing anxiety that him wanting to love and be loved by men could end up with him getting hurt or killed. So he ends up thinking that's the only correct association, that his sexuality can't be something to draw joy from, it can only be experienced correctly through the lens of violence. Violence which consumes him, consumes all the other men who find escapism in this way, and eventually spirals out of control to threaten the safety of people and communities outside of their group. This echoes a common sentiment among gay people who live outside of places where the queers tend to congregate, for example in more rural areas where it will be harder for them to find a support system to show them that the things they're feeling don't have to exclusively carry a hateful and negative connotation. The narrator has never had anything like this kind of support and so he's slowly grown to hate himself over the years and perhaps without even fully realising why. Remember that when he first fights another man, when Tyler demands he punch him, he's actually beating himself up. On some level, he has grown to believe that because of his sexuality, he deserves any violence he gets. This isolation leads the narrator to an extremely warped understanding of what being queer is, and we can follow this through line into Project Mayhem, the anarchist all-male cult that the narrator slash Tyler starts in his basement. Back in my day when we did this kind of thing, it just ended up as a Halo LAN party instead of a terrorist organisation, but to each their own. Project Mayhem is a kind of warped idea of what queer activism is, i.e. someone knowing about what happened at the Stonewall Inn in 1969, but assuming that it was just random outbursts of violence and not carefully coordinated pushback against the discriminatory policies of the NYPD. 
This project looks on the surface like it's doing cool revolutionary things to topple the rich and powerful, but is in fact mostly committed to doing random shit that just looks edgy, such as vandalizing a bland but inoffensive corporate sculpture and blowing up all the credit card companies, which, okay. I spent all of 1999 crying and peeing myself, so admittedly I don't really remember how data storage worked back then, but I have a feeling that just blowing up credit card companies' headquarters won't magically erase everyone's debt. They presumably have backups. What I do think this will do is fill downtown, not Los Angeles, with an apocalyptic amount of asbestos, which... If I'm wrong, fair enough. My apologies for being a tiny little baby brain. But then again, if all the credit card details for, I guess, the whole city are erased when you destroy the computers or the databases in these buildings, why blow them up? Isn't it less of a ball ache to just go in and smash up the servers or something? There's almost certainly several people in your club who know how these things work. Get them to delete the data. Though I suppose it would be a less impactful ending if the narrator just did like the Walt and Jesse Van thing outside of the company headquarters. Point being that Project Mayhem is a dumb club for dumb babies and I hate them all. All those men standing around and we just end up doing manual labor? Home of phobia. Just as I did thanks to my massive brain, the narrator ultimately realizes that the fights are emotionally unfulfilling. Yes, he gets to touch men, but surprise surprise, whacking them upside the head is no substitute for the thing that this is all a metaphor for. Boinking. Similar to his disconnect with Marla, the narrator watches Tyler fight with other men when it's actually himself doing that. But he still has to watch through Tyler. Fight Club has rendered him totally unable to even form a dishonest connection with anyone else now, and often when he does fight as himself, he ends up going too far and really hurting... Wait, Jared Leto is in this thing? What the f- So the narrator's ultimate rejection of Project Mayhem makes the ending open to a wide variety of interpretations. To defeat Tyler, he puts a gun in his mouth, and if you are under the age of 18, the movie ends there. Here's a nickel, run along, get yourself a Sony Pop champ. For everyone else who's too cool for school, he puts a bullet through his own cheek and Tyler vanishes. So has the narrator suppressed his true feelings forever at the cost of killing the part of him that can feel, metaphorically represented by the fact that he's got a massive hole in his face now? Or did he just manage to kill the negative feelings about himself, the manifestation of that idea previously mentioned that he deserves violence? When he holds Marla's hand at the end, has he resolved to accept her as essentially his beard or finally as a friend, a fellow outcast? Oh, this isn't a hypothetical. I'm giving you three seconds to pick one of those interpretations. Okay, whichever one you said was wrong, and I was thinking of the other one. If you didn't pick either, then <laughs> I'm coming to get you. Fight Club, in its broadest sense, is about the struggle between being what everyone else expects you to be versus what you really are, and that obviously lends itself to a variety of interpretations. Depending on your personal experience, the narrator could also be trans, he could be a victim of capitalism, or maybe he's just a quirked up white boy who- No, I'm not finishing this goddamn sentence and don't you dare leave this part in! Obviously, the interpretation of him as a queer man hits the hardest for me, as a queer man, and this brings me back to the main thesis of the video, why Fight Club should be considered bona fide queer cinema. And I think the main point that I can make in its favour here is that it should be considered a queer film because it's not immediately a queer film to anyone who's not queer. What's more queer than that? Art that contains little gay codes, queer winks to those in the know, is I think a fantastic representation of what has so often brought film-loving LGBTQ plus people together. Fight Club is for the gays. And nobody even knew it. Except now they do know because I just told everyone watching this video how gay the movie is. Ah, for fuck. <laughs>